is IEEE Talk. I've known Natalie for more than 10 years, 12 years, I don't know. Yeah, 12 years. 12 years, yeah. So we used to work together in the same company in Albuquerque. There's a company called New Mexico Resonance. And, and Natalie and both of us worked together there. And she has worked in lung imaging, which I'm currently doing with Gene Kiki before. And also she has worked with nanoparticles. And I think she's going to tell us about post-mortem imaging that she's doing now. And one challenging thing is that these studies are done on a clinical scanner. And it was done on the same 1.5 PC mins that was over here. Yeah. So the challenge is how to use the clinical protocols with good contrast in post-mortem tissue. But I think we'll also probably know why this task is important, why, why is she doing it. So welcome, Natalie. Thank you. Uh, so I am uh, working just down the hill from you guys at the uh, New Mexico Scientific Laboratories, which houses the Office of the Medical Investigator. Um, my collaborators on this project include uh, Chandra Gerard, who's uh, a certified technologist uh, for MR and CT, and uh, Gary Hatch and Kurt Nolte. Um, Gary Hatch is a forensic radiologist, and Kurt Nolte is a forensic pathologist and he's also now the chief of the Office of the Medical Investigator. And most of the things I'm going to be talking about today are funded by uh, a National Institute of Justice award. Um, and so as one of my collaborators has said, it's better to be funded by the Department of Justice than investigated by the <laughs> Department of Justice. So, um, so I'm trying to, I guess, put Albuquerque in a better light with so, okay, so the context of my work is um, really as part of forensic pathology, and so I just wanted to give a very sort of brief little bit of context about that. So the first recorded um, dissection of a body to study disease um, appears in the literature in 300 BC. Um, and the first recorded forensic autopsy, so that would have been an autopsy performed to actually figure out, you know, who was at fault in the death, uh, was in 1302 AD. Um, the modern autopsy technique that we use basically dates to 1850 AD um, and is uh, attributed to Rudolf Virchow. Um, and so that involves external examination of the body, um, the Y incision um, that allows the removal of the internal organs, um, removal of the top of the skull and examination of the brain, and then basically gross and microscopic um, examination of all tissues. And that kind of methodology um, dates back to Virchow. Um, so why do we do autopsies? Um, so if you watch CSI, there's the obvious need to um, address legal questions like the cause and manner of death. Um, there's also important medical reasons. Um, so, for example, verification of a medical diagnosis may provide important information about hereditary diseases to the family. Um, there's also the issue of just sort of diagnostic quality control. Um, did the person die of what the doctor really thought they had? Um, and that's important for medical education. And there's also research um, issues that come up like identification of previously unknown diseases. So Lewy bodies is an example of something that was discovered at um, autopsy. Um, and then there's also a public health and safety component to what the OMI does. So that includes elucidating mechanisms and causes of preventable injuries or diseases and identifying emerging health threats such as in New Mexico in the 1990s, um, Hansvarer's pulmonary syndrome. So, uh, where does medical imaging come in? So, first I just wanted to say a few words about kind of the parallel history of medical imaging. So, uh, the x-ray was basically invented in 1895, and it was pretty much immediately used both clinically and in the forensic setting. Um, and currently, x-rays are required for medical examiner office accreditation. So, that's um, a go-to technique for medical examiners. Um, so the first digital mini computer um, was commercially available in 1960, and I mentioned computers because you can't really do 3D imaging unless you can compute things. So 
Um, it's not surprising then that following um, the availability of small computers, X-ray com computed tomography became available, um, and not long after that, magnetic resonance imaging. And of course, as you guys know, CT and MRI are now ubiquitous in the clinical setting, and one of the results of that is that um, exploratory surgery, which I remember my grandmother having, nobody has exploratory surgery these days. You go in and you get an image done, and then they figure out if they should cut you open or not. So, I mean, this has really revolutionized medicine. Um, and so, you know, the question is kind of what can it do for forensic pathology? So, if you have a person who is dead and doesn't mind being cut into, um, and there's no sort of risk associated with cutting into them, why would you want to do uh, 3D clinical imaging um, in the forensic setting? So, one reason is to improve the accuracy of the information that you gain. So um, studies have shown that autopsy plus imaging is more accurate than either um, method of looking at the body alone. Um, you can imagine that you can do a whole body CT of a person in a moderate amount of time, um, dissecting every cubic you know, millimeter voxel of a person um, with a knife would take a long time. So I mean, there's some things that imaging can do in terms of screening a whole body and then giving you information that you can archive um, that you just can't get from autopsy. Um, there's um, a belief that we may be able to improve courtroom exhibits. So this is um, a 3D rendering based on CT of somebody who died of a traumatic head injury. You can imagine, well, maybe you can imagine that the scene photograph is very ugly and it's very hard to even tell that it's a person's head. So it's both yucky and doesn't convey very much information. Um, this is a lot more um, clean and understandable for a jury to look at what the nature of a person's injury is. Um, in New Mexico, um, it's important uh, to avoid autopsy if possible to honor religious and cultural desires, um, particularly in New Mexico of um, Native American people, but um, there are other um, religious traditions that um, really would prefer no autopsy if possible, so um, when possible we would like to do the examination non-invasively. And there's also a potential shortage of forensic pathologists. So currently in the U.S. Um, some jurisdictions are medical examiner jurisdictions where a, an, a forensic pathologist who is an MD performs autopsies. In other jurisdictions, you have coroners, and coroners can be people over the age of 18 who haven't had a felony. That would be a qualification <laughs> to be elected as coroner, and so those people may or may not have extensive medical knowledge. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Um, if we move more jurisdictions from a coroner system to a medical examiner system, we currently don't have enough forensic pathologists in the country. There are only about 400, actually, um, so, um, it, yeah, it's a small group of folks. Um, so being able to do some um, examinations by imaging rather than by autopsy may uh, prove important. So, although there are good reasons to do advanced imaging, it's currently not very common, especially in the U.S. So, um, the New Mexico Office of the Medical Investigator is the only medical examiner's office in the United States that has both CT and MR in-house. Um, advanced forensic imaging is much more commonly used in Europe, Japan, and Australia than it is uh, in the U.S. currently. Um, some of the obstacles include um, the fact that autopsy itself is actually on the decline, so especially in coroner jurisdictions. Um, in coroner jurisdictions, they may not even have access to x-ray, let alone CT or MRI. Um, certainly CT and MRI are more expensive than x-ray and there's currently no sort of federal mandate or federal funding to do this. And I think importantly from a researcher perspective, the utility um, of CT and MR as a part of forensic investigation has not been completely established. That's an ongoing research topic. So basically what needs to happen is further research to establish utility and justify cost and then also 
Um, and then consolidation of jurisdictions to basically um, make it more cost effective. Okay. So um, the UNM Center for Forensic Imaging is housed in the um, Office of the Medical Investigator, which is a statewide centralized office. So anybody that dies within the boundaries of um, New Mexico is autopsied at um, OMI if they if their death was in any way suspicious, unexpected, unattended. Um, so there's about 2,000 autopsies performed per year at the OMI, and um, our office is unusual in that it is um, academically based, so we're part of the medical school, and so that means we have access to forensic pathologists, radiologists, physics um, people, statistics collaborators, et cetera. Um, the laboratory is a state-of-the-art BSL-3 lab, and I, I should say BSL-3 kind of in quotes because um, they really run it as BSL-2 most of the time, except when there's actually bodies out and cutting is happening, and then they go into a BSL-3 mode where people wear full PPE and um, extra precautions are taken. But at the end of the day, when they're done um, with cases, the facility is decontaminated, and then I can go in there in a regular lab, lab coat and gloves, and um, so that works out. Um, so there's three, um, oh, so here's our scanners. So a 16 slice CT, and then a 1.5T MRI, <coughs> which indeed was the one that used to be at the mine uh, once upon a time. And right now we have three research grants from the National Institute of Justice, uh, one for forensic CT and the other two for MRI. Okay, so why do post-mortem MRI? So since it's non-invasive and non-destructive, it can be used pre-autopsy and it won't sort of destroy any evidence or anything that the forensic pathologist would look at. Um, the superior soft tissue detail relative to CT um, is, is certainly helpful and interestingly, good contrast can even be obtained in rather badly decomposed brain. So the brain of this subject, if the skull were open, would pour like a liquid onto the table. Um, and yet there's still clear structure and the possibility of um, identifying you know, some kind of trauma or injury even in a, a moderately decomposed, decomposed person. Um, and of course, another reason to do MR is that it's quantitative. Um, so we can do actual measurements and we can archive image data, which is sort of different from autopsy findings, which can be somewhat documented by photographs, but it mostly consists of a report that cannot be really duplicated. Um, okay, so MR image contrast. So as you guys probably know, um, X-ray contrast depends on density, um, but MR contrast depends on relaxation times, um, mainly T1 and T2 of um, water and also lipids in tissue. So one of the things that's interesting is that postmortem contrast sometimes different, differs from clinical MR. And we know that T1 and T2 will have some dependence on temperature. And the question is maybe what other factors. So for example, here's a T1 weighted and T2 weighted clinical scan. Um, in a deceased subject, the T1 contrast is obviously um, very poor. Um, the T2 contrast is really not bad at all. And so, you know, one of the questions I want to address is what's going on with endogenous contrast in uh, postmortem brain? So, other postmortem factors to um, account for include things like position dependent sedimentation. Um, so, blood cells will sink out of the plasma over time. Um, hypoxia, which you guys know is a good contrast mechanism in vivo. Um, we have it sort of everywhere, I guess. Um, and also things like changes in the proportions of free bound and interfacial water. So just as an example, um, the apparent diffusion coefficient in brain is reduced by about a factor of two immediately post-mortem, and that's relative to um, in vivo, so that's not a temperature effect, it's just a, a no more physiology effect. Um, and then there's all the possible decompositional changes, including changing metabolite concentrations, increase in 
pH, um, gas formation, which can become a problem um, because, you know, gas water boundaries create susceptibility artifacts, so we have to be mindful of um, gas formation. And then overall changes in gross and microscopic structures such as cell membrane degradation, um, which leads to the brains that are a little sweet. All right, so in terms of post-mortem um, 3D imaging, so far post-mortem CT is outpacing post-mortem MR in terms of applications. So um, a recent survey of the International Society of Forensic Radiology and Imaging showed that 42% of the members of that organization are routinely using post-mortem CT, but only 12% currently are using MR. Um, so some of the barriers include um, just overall less access to MR scanners, um, time and cost constraints. Um, CT is a bit faster, and so if you are gonna slip into somebody's hospital CT, it's easier to do that than with an MR. Um, also, I think there's much less experience with performing and interpreting postmortem MR because MR is a more complicated modality than CT, and currently there's a lack of standardized protocols optimized for postmortem MR. So I think you know postmortem MR is really a work in progress right now, and one of the things that I've noticed is that um, more recent studies of postmortem MR utility, and by utility people mean they they compare the imaging findings to autopsy findings as the gold standard. So if you're comparing MR to autopsy findings, recently the results have gotten better than when people first started trying this, and that was. But basically about 1990 was the first um, first foray into forensic imaging with MR. And so you can imagine if you have experience with MR that in the last you know, 25 years, um, lots of things have changed. Um, MR hardware and sequences keep improving. Um, also the recognition of normal postmortem changes is improving and that improves interpretability of the postmortem images. And I think uh, overall the utility of postmortem MR for identifying specific pathologies is becoming somewhat better defined. So if you apply it to the right population, then the results relative to autopsy or relative to CT can be very favorable. But it's still the case that the op optimization of acquisition protocols to account for normal postmortem change is, is needed. And I'll show you some data that applies to that in a little bit. Um, so one thing that is certainly true is that postmortem MR is good for finding fluid. Um, and so if you're looking for a pathological fluid accumulation due to some kind of disease or injury process, um, T2-weighted postmortem MR works great. So here's an example of edema due to blunt force trauma to the chest in this um, decedent. And this is, um, this is the cardiac muscle short axis and this is somebody who suffered a myocardial infarction. So there's an area of focal necrosis right there, and then um, it's surrounded by parafocal edema that shows up right under T2-weighted imaging. And you know, it's not surprising in some ways that right now T2-weighted imaging is kind of the go-to technique for postmortem MR because T2 should be less temperature dependent than T1. And so you're more likely to be able to take clinical sequences out of the box and use them and have them work well. Okay, so one of the applications we're interested in is using postmortem MR to evaluate nerve injury. So here's an example from a group in Japan of um, a person that suffered a, basically a whiplash injury, but it didn't result in any kind of um, dislocation or fracture. <laughs> Um, it just resulted in soft tissue injuries. So in particular, you can see intraneural bleeding by MR as a um, hypo intensity under T2 weighted imaging, and that correlated with um, intraneural uh, bleeding found in autopsy. And so one of our interests in using, um, using this technique for nerve injury is um, to evaluate uh, shaken infants. So, there is, um, there's sort of the classical triad that's identified in shaken baby syndrome that involves petechial 
um, hemorrhaging and um, let's see, subdural hematoma, and there's one other thing that involves brain injury. But anyway, there's an alternative theory that says that maybe the primary injury in shaken baby syndrome is actually cervical nerve root injury. And so let me just say a few words about that. So the proposed mechanism is that um, because infants are obligate diaphragmatic breathers and it's the nerve roots at C3, C4, and C5 that um, come around to uh, innervate the diaphragm, um, that what can happen is that shaking that causes hyperextension and hyperflexion of the cervical spine can cause damage of the nerve roots, which of course are trying to poke through the foramina of the um, vertebra and can get sheared um, under shaking. So this causes nerve root damage, which may include hemorrhage and swelling of the nerve roots. Um, if the damage is extensive enough to cause paralysis, then the thought is that paralysis of the diaphragm is what leads to asphyxia and hypoxic brain injury. And that the, um, the brain effects are actually downstream from the um, original um, cervical nerve injury. So the idea is that mechanical injury to the brain, actual hitting of the brain against the skull, may not be the primary injury mechanism in shaken baby syndrome. And there is actually a fair bit of mechanical modeling to support the idea that you can't shake an infant hard enough to cause um, the acceleration deceleration of the brain against the skull that you would need to explain the injuries that are seen. So either you have shaking that also involves impact, or there's some other mechanism. That's basically the idea. Um, so here's an example of um, some histology of a normal um, spinal column, normal nerve roots. Um, this is an infant that was subject to hyperextension, hyperflexion due to an auto accident, and you can see that there's um, significant hemorrhage in the um, cervical nerve roots. And so that's what we're wondering if we'll be able to see by MRI. Um, so the issues are that um, infants are very small, so we'll be needing to optimize um, to obtain submillimeter re resolution. Um, and also then evaluate image contrast arriving, arising from not just fresh, but also old hemorrhage. So some infants who are shaken die immediately, some infants who are shaken die after being on a ventilator for some weeks. So um, we have to be ready to look for many different stages of um, aging of hemorrhage. And here's just an example of um, an infant decedent. This was a normal, not one that um, was suspected of shaking. But you can see um, you know, we're able to get some millimeter resolution in about 20 minutes. This shows the C5 nerve root on the left side. Um, reasonably nicely, and so now the question is, um, if we see, if there is blood, can we see it? And so that's one of the grants that uh, we're working on from the NIJ. Okay, but I'm gonna focus mostly today on um, our first, some of the results of our first grant, which was to address much more basic questions. So these include, if the postmortem MR image differs from a normal clinical image, can we identify the cause? You know, basically, um, can we figure out what is due to normal temperature-dependent changes and what is due to other sort of normal postmortem factors? And then can we adjust the protocols to produce images that look more clinical so that a radiologist interpreting them will have a, a better time with things? Um, so just to remind you that, um, that overall it's the the tissue um, relaxation times T1 and T2 that um, govern contrast. And so we're you know, interested in um, adjusting imaging sequences to produce the biggest difference between different tissue types. And because um, the rate at which um, magnetization relaxes um, or decays is temperature dependent, we may need to slide these echo times or repetition times around a little bit to optimize um, differences in contrast. Okay, so the basis of 1.5T clinical MR protocols is that all the different tissues in your body have particular values of T1 and T2, and you can put them in a nice tidy table 
if all you're worried about is 37 degrees C and one field strength. Um, so, of course, seedings tend to come in a variety of temperatures, and some of them come in a variety of um, times since death, which is the post-mortem interval. So it turns out there's just very few reports of T1 and T2 of unfixed post-mortem mammalian tissue at 1.5 or 3T. So there was some work done on post-mortem mammalian tissues back in the early days of MR when people were working at like 0.3T or lower fields. Not so much since the clinical fields became um, ubiquitous. And so I'm looking at um, expanding this chart basically to include temperature as a variable, postmortem interval as a variable, um, samples that have been frozen and then rethawed and imaged after freezing, and also samples that have undergone chemical fixation. So basically what I'm doing um, is not very sexy but I'm measuring T1 and T2 versus temperature for a whole bunch of postmortem tissues. So these are ex vivo animal tissues. I'm generally measuring the brains in the skull and I'm using um, a fiber optic thermometry system that's MR compatible. So if any of you should ever have any need to do temperature measurements in the MR suite, I've got actually two fiber optic uh, thermometry systems. So I'm happy to loan one. Um, and so this is, um, Standard spin echo imaging where I'm either holding TE fixed and varying TR or holding a TR fixed and varying TE. And so then I just plot signal intensities for a given uh, tissue versus either TR or TE and then extract the appropriate uh, exponential time constant. Okay, so let me just kind of show you what the effect of temperature on postmortem imaging can look like. So this is the same subject at two different temperatures imaged with the same T2 weighted, or sorry, T1 weighted spin echo protocol. Um, you can definitely see that the T1 contrast is poorer at lower temperature, and especially the fat muscle contrast is very poor. So, um, and this is a busy slide, but um, it kind of captures what's going on um, really in, in pretty much all the tissues of the body. So um, let me start with T1 data here. So muscle and other tissues that I would call aqueous, like cardiac muscle, kidney, spleen, um, all show a kind of similar temperature dependence to this where the T1 is higher at, at normal body temperature and as you drop the temperature, the T1 goes down. Um, I was worried about things like um, rigor mortis affecting um, my temperature behavior, so I was careful to do these measurements both upon um, warming and upon cooling. So basically I started at body temperature, let it cool down, and then warmed it back up. Um, so okay, a little bit of temperature dependence in T1 and not very much hysteresis comparing warming to cooling. Um, the fat T1 was basically um, temperature independent and showed only a very small hysteresis upon warming and cooling. Um, if I go to the um, T2, then muscle shows no hysteresis and no temperature dependence to speak of. Um, the fat T2 is where things got really interesting. So um, I started out with a fat T2 value of about 90 milliseconds, which is I think similar to the in vivo value, um, but upon cooling, the T2 actually plummets and um, it by more than a factor of two down to 40 milliseconds um, at cold temperatures. The interesting thing was that when I warmed back up, um, I didn't actually get the full signal back and I didn't recover the T2 value I had before. So it appears that there's some kind of um, phase transition going on in fat at um, at around 15 degrees C. So uh, just to summarize sort of um, what's going on um, with, with the body, most organs show a similar temperature dependence as muscle, and so that had T1 being linear in the temperature and a very weak temperature dependence of T2 or no temperature 
fat and liver, which has a lot of lipid in it, show a weak T1 dependence by contrast. And then fat um, shows this extremely strong T2 dependence that's not seen in, a, in any of the other tissues. Um, it turns out that um, porcine fat and human fat are both about 40% oleic acid. And oleic acid has a, um, has a phase transition. It solidifies at 15 degrees C. And so that's what we're seeing. So if you imagine um, while butter sitting on your counter is kind of hard in the winter when it's 65 degrees in your house and kind of soft in the summer when it's 75 degrees in your house, well, you know, right around there is something's going on in, um, in mammalian fat too. So anyway, that does affect the MR, and so that means that if possible, postmortem MR should probably be performed before cooling the body. Um, if the body temperature is below 35C, but above, say, about 15 or 20, then just reducing TR to improve the T1 contrast is an option. Um, if the body is cooled to less than 20 degrees C, or especially below that phase transition at 15, then you really start to see um, things change. So for T1-weighted imaging, you'll want to use the shortest TE available to try to get rid of any unwanted T2-weighting. Um, and for T2-weighted imaging, you need to be ready for muscle and fat to actually reverse their roles. So here's the normal thing we're all used to. Fat is bright, muscle is dark. Um, at cold temperature, fat is dark and muscle is bright. So there you go. Um, okay, but for this audience, it's probably important to uh, tell you about the brain. So the interesting thing about the brain is, um, so this paper by Ruder et al. sort of emphasized the, the muscle and fat differences, but didn't actually say anything about the brain. And I realized that, that brain just doesn't look T1 weighted. Um, so I blew up uh, the picture there, and indeed, um, Normally, in T1-weighted um, imaging of, of in vivo brain, um, you would get, um, a, you know, the white matter would look a lot brighter than the gray matter. You'd get nice contrast. That is absent here. So, and that's even absent at 35C, so it's not really a temperature effect. Something else is going on. So, I wanted to make sure that in um, my animal samples, we were seeing the same thing. So um, this is an antelope that someone kindly provided for me. Um, and um, I did T1 weighted, proton density weighted, and T2 weighted imaging. And indeed, if you compare to human clinical images, um, here you have nice white matter showing up. Um, here it's very flat. Um, but the proton density weighted scan looks kind of the same, and the T2 weighted scans look kind of the same. So the question is, what is going on T1 weighted imaging at normal body temperature in these postmortem subjects? So I assumed, because T1 weighted imaging looked terrible, that it must be because there was a reduction in the difference between the gray matter and white matter T1 values. And I assumed that because T1 imaging looked great postmortem, the T2 must not be affected. So, I was wrong on many accounts, not the first time. Um, so it turns out that if you actually look at the postmortem T1 values, um, they're both longer than the corresponding um, in vivo va values, but the difference between them actually increases. It doesn't decrease. So that's weird. And then um, what's really um, striking is that the white matter T2 actually decreases a lot that difference becomes much larger than it was um, in vivo. Um, so basically what's going on is that although if you consider only the T1 values, you would think that white matter would be brighter than gray matter under normal um, T1 weighted imaging. Um, nevertheless, it turns out they're, they're the same. It doesn't look like the in vivo. And so of course, remember that the signal intensity depends on more than just uh, the one parameter. And so it turns out that it's sort of the combination of all these factors that give you such flat contrast in this image. So um, the white matter proton density is less than the gray matter proton density, and that would be the, the density of mobile 
um, sort of mobile water, mobile protons. Um, and that's just pretty much the same as it is in in vivo imaging. But when you combine um, that with the fact that the T2 goes down by so much post-mortem, um, then this factor and this factor kind of kill this factor and um, you end up with rather flat contrast. And so it's not, and it's not just a temperature effect um, because this is happening at, um, in post-mortem subjects that are near body temperature. Um, so one thing you can do to make up for this is um, to play a little bit with inversion recovery. So it turns out that you just can't shorten TE enough to make up for the short T2 in white matter using kind of a normal uh, clinical spin echo sequence. But instead, you can, um, you can take a flare sequence and mess with both the TI and the TE to come up with something that will give you bright uh, white matter. So if you reduce TI to about 700 milliseconds and you shorten the TE as much as you can, um, then you get this. And so here's a, a live pig that I just grabbed out of the literature, and you can see the white matter is brighter than the gray matter like you expect. Here's um, the pig brain under normal T1-weighted imaging post-mortem. So this is my uh, image. And then if you do this um, inversion recovery sequence, um, you can bring back out the white matter. Um, and it looks a little more T1-weighted, although obviously, Although white to gray gives you kind of the, the sense that you want, some of the other um, structures have funny contrast. So you give up something, but you could gain something too. So. Okay, so what about the temperature dependence? I told you what's going on at near body temperature. Um, it turns out that just like with muscle, um, both gray and white matter have a linear uh, dependence of T1 on temperature. It turns out, though, that it's a lot stronger for gray matter than white matter. And so um, as you decrease the temperature, the T1 of gray and white matter actually more or less converge as you get close to freezing temperature. And so at that point, uh, if, T1, if the T1 values are really the same, even inversion recovery can't help you bring the contrast back. Um, so you really do lose contrast um, at low temperature. The T2 values here are pretty messy. I think I need to go back and look for hysteresis effects because white matter, of course, um, contains um, lipids, and I should know what they are, but I don't, and I don't know if they have phase transitions, so I don't know how much of the kind of rattiness of some of this data is because I need to go back and be more careful about the order in which I take my temperatures. Um, but in any case, um, the T2 two values really don't show very much dependence on temperature. They're just kind of different from each other and are more different than they are. Uh, so. Okay, so to summarize the brain imaging results, um, there's a loss of T1 contrast in postmortem brain at so-called normal body temperature, and it involves multiple parameters, not just um, the T1 relaxation time. And uh, the reduced value of the white matter T2 seems to really be the dominant effect in postmortem contrast at body temperature. Um, so it actually leads to better than normal contrast if you're doing T2 weighted imaging, but worse than normal contrast um, if you're doing T1 weighted imaging. Um, if things aren't too cold, then using inversion recovery with a short TE um, and sort of a moderate TI gives you T1 light contrast in uh, postmortem subjects. And um, with decreasing temperature, because the gray and white matter, um, T1s both decrease and there's a stronger decrease of the gray matter T1 that results in convergence of those values near 4C and, and that really does result in an almost complete loss of gray matter, white matter contrast. So, I mean, I think the take home message is that you can do a lot of things in fresh, unfixed postmortem tissue, but if you're going to keep people in the refrigerator for long periods of time, um, you know, neuroimaging is going to suffer. So you really want to do it fast and do it while the body is still uh, warm if you're not going to work in fixed tissue. All right, so uh, 
want to just acknowledge my funding agency. Um, there are a lot of helpful people at the New Mexico Office of the Medical Investigator who make it possible for me to be there in the autopsy suite doing my work. Um, so I could not have figured out all of the hysteresis effects in fat and muscle if I wasn't able to get really fresh, warm tissue. So I mean, I never would have figured it out if I was ordering tissue shipped on ice. So um, I owe so much to Mike Minifee, who's the owner of Western Way Custom Meats in Moriarty, New Mexico. Um, his butcher, Henry Melendez, is my savior for this project. Um, and uh, Norbert Tokic at uh, the veterinary, or sorry, at veterinary Di diagnostic services, which is in the same building with El Mai, has also been really helpful um, in providing animal tissue and advice. And then I want to acknowledge the IACUC and my animal tissue protocol. And um, with that, I <laughs> thank you for your attention. You guys are impressive. So um, imaging at the OMI is like 350 bucks an hour, and um, and I guess you know I spend about I would say on average I spend about half an hour per um, per T1 T2 measurement, um, but I I can. If I'm doing ex vivo tissue, I can load up a whole bunch of six wall plates in a box and put it in a head coil. And so I can be running like, you know, up to, I don't know, sometimes I double them up with the six wall plates. So sometimes I can do as many as, um, I guess, 36 tissues at the same time. And so, you know, the MR kind of costs what the MR costs, but, um, but for the, yeah, for the organs, I'm using just little bits of tissue. I didn't really find that trying to do brain ex situ was a very good idea, and so I guess that's a more costly experiment in the sense that I have the whole head in there and that's all it fits. Um, but yeah, this has been, um, I, you know, I feel very fortunate to have the funding from the NIJ and also to be working on a scanner where I can, ha I mean, these temperature studies take a long time. I did a lot of all-nighters to to basically get everything done within 48 hours, but actually go all the way up and all the way back down in temperature. And so to be able to work on a scanner where it's not in a hospital and nobody else is competing for the time, um, that was kind of amazing. And you know, it's not gonna last, right? Either we, get, we have to get more business and then I won't have as much time or they'll have to you know, shut the scanner down. So, um, so if you wanna do anything post-mortem, how long, how long does it take to get thermally converted in this Um, So for the stuff in six well plates, I've got um, a refrigerated incubator, so I can basically, it's circulating air in a big box, and I can run it from like 2 degrees C up to 50 degrees C. So the probably only half an hour, 15 minutes um, for the six well plate measurements, but for the heads, I pretty much, it takes forever. I mean, it takes a long time. So, so for the heads, I try to keep them warm, do a measurement when I first arrive, and then I just set them out in the room with the temperature probe in there and just let it coast down. And um, yeah, and then, and then when it gets to room temperature, then I put it in the fridge and cool it down the rest of the way, and then I'll take it out and let it kind of coast back up. But it takes a while. So there's no temperature no, there's not a temperature controller right on the tissue. So sometimes I'll put an ice pack in, or maybe some of you who do animal imaging know about these um, isothermal pads that they're like a waxy substance that you heat up in the microwave. And when it goes through its first order phase transition, it sits there at about 39C. So those warming pads will last a couple hours, ice will last a couple hours. So some, sometimes I have ice or a warming pad to try to either keep it high or let it be low. But mostly I just stick the temperature probe in and just kind of let it go. So I'm logging the temperature continuously as I'm making measurements. And 
So maybe my T1 measurement's at a little bit different temperature than my T2 measurement, um, but I'm keeping track of it, so, you know, it's interesting. And you, you really learn about how, just like how much thermal mass tissue has and like, you know, whenever you want it to go faster, it takes forever. And whenever you, you'd like it to sit at a temperature, it cools too quickly or, you know, it's, I'm always fighting sort of that, but anyway. Yes. I'm a highly Sorry, I didn't under. So it's been easier to more quickly apply it in the postmortem setting. So was it easy for you to find pulse sequences like even in fetal measurements? Or you, just you know, I just I'm just using regular spin echo sequences and just running running repeated Yeah, repeated images with different parameters. And then I'm just using mean curve on the scanner to draw my ROIs and pull off my values. So um, I didn't want to get into the issue of, you know, all the possible faster ways you could measure T1 or T2 because, eh, you know, um, that kind of wasn't the, the most important thing. But is this kind of um, my grant and Dr. Hatch's grant are the main um, are the two main users. So we're not using it for decedents very heavily, and other than our two research projects, we don't have a lot uh, going on over there right now. So there's a, there's time available at 1.5T should you need it. Yes. And so, um, 
I've shown data previously where I thought I was seeing PMI dependence. It was almost entirely temperature dependence. It was because I was receiving specimens from people that had already been refrigerated, and they were warming back up as I was um, looking. And so I think if one did a careful, a careful study where you maintain the temperature at a constant um, level, that you probably learn some things. But then you have to work fast because heat comp goes fast at 37 C. So, but I would like to, you know, if anybody is interested um, in separating, you know, so one of the one of the nice things about I guess, is that um, not only do you have a hypoxic ischemic injury, say, well, whole brain's hypoxic ischemic, but, you know, you have other factors that are different, too. So you could potentially um, compare uh, a brain in someone who's suffered a stroke in a region to um, actual um, deceased brain and see what the differences are. And I think that would be some things. Certainly that would be useful to me to understand what I'm seeing. It may be um, going back the other way too, but um, anyway. And of course, Stefan would like to use some of our subjects as negative controls for functional imaging, so. Because <laughs> we can provide anatomy without function. We can definitely do that, so. Um, Yeah, I mostly 